to be manifested in our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus. We declare that, Lord, today, Lord, you will come down and you meet us at the point of our needs, Lord. You meet us at the point of our spiritual needs, our physical needs, our financial needs, our health needs, our relationship needs, our mental needs. You meet us at all the points of our needs today, Lord Almighty. And you turn us to be just like you, Holy Father. You turn our hearts and our minds towards you. Hearts of stones that are coming to you today, Father Lord, you turn them into hearts of flesh. Father Lord, today you make us not just people who are going to receive from you. You are going to make us God-like people and we too we shall be givers unto others, Lord. We shall give people time. We shall give people resources. We shall give people help, Lord Almighty. Today, Lord, we shall look upon the mirror and as your word says, we are changed from glory to glory. Today, Lord, by the time we finish this service, we'll be more like you, Lord. You will imbibe in us, you into us, Lord. We are indeed the gift of God. We thank you for today, Lord. With expectation, we'll come to you today, Lord. And we declare, because your word has said so, that our expectation shall not be cut off, Lord. Thank you so much for today, Lord. Blessed be your holy name. In the mighty name of Jesus, we are prayed. Amen and amen. Please let us be seated as we greet one another. Say hello. How are you? How are you doing? God bless you. I have been pleading with us that we should try as much as possible to come for the time of healing, which is next Sunday in person, not just in Zoom. Mm -hmm. Don't be lazy with things of God. Before COVID, we were always meeting here. You can at least come for a time of healing in person. Thank you, Jesus. There are some of us here that have made a point of praying for others. Those of us that have been praying for others, you would have started to notice certain things. The Lord would start talking to you more and more about other people. He will start talking to you about their distresses, about their challenges. He has appointed you as a physician. And when you go to a doctor, he patient will tell the doctor what is wrong, what is bothering this person, what is affecting this person. Just pray for them when you have that kind of revelation. Know that as you pray for others, Jesus prays for you. When you pray for others, your needs will be met without you having to pray for yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Today I want to talk about the blessings of goodness. The blessings of goodness. And I can do a precy of really my message because as I said a few weeks ago, all I preach is kingdom dynamics. And so I can ask you the person who was attacked by armed robbers and the person who was not attacked, who 
who is the person who was blessed? The person who was afflicted or the person who was not afflicted? Who is the person who was blessed? The Lazarus who died or the Lazarus who did not die? Who was the person who was blessed? Let's look at Psalm 21 from where I got the title of this message. Psalm 21. Ike have you heard from her? Glory be to God. Psalm 21, verse 21. No, verse 1. I'm reading from verse, just, just the first three verses. The king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord. And in your salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice? You have given him his heart's desire. And have not withheld the request of his lips. For you meet him with the blessings of goodness. You set a crown of pure gold on his head. You meet him with the blessings of goodness. I don't know if God has met anybody here with the blessings of goodness. Mm -hmm. The specificity is important because people describe blessings in different ways. Some people will give a testimony and say they were blessed with money. That's the blessing of money, if money can be a blessing. Some people will say, I was blessed with a child. Some people will say, I was blessed with a promotion. God says, that is a blessing, which is of goodness. Do you want that kind of blessing? Matthew Henry, the famous uh, Bible scholar, 19th century, we are still reading his scholarship today. My question this morning was that Matthew Henry was robbed. And the question is, was God good to him? Is God good to that man? who is robbed or is he good to the man who is not robbed Matthew Henry insists that when God decided to show him how good he is to him he caused him to be robbed it's a very strange person but then we are supposed to be peculiar people. And so Matthew Henry prayed a prayer of thanksgiving to God for being robbed. And this is what he says. He says, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. Second, because they, although they took my wallet, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took my all, it was not much. And fourth, because I was the one who was robbed, I was not the one who robbed somebody. And he says, I need to bless God for this grace 
I don't know whether you have ever blessed God that you are not a robber. Have you ever blessed God that you are not a thief? Have you ever blessed God that you are not a murderer? The grace of God is very strange and very all-encompassing. I want to look at Luke 13, verses 1 to 9. Luke 13, 1 to 9. The statement of Jesus. Luke 13, verses 1 to 9. There were present at that season some who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell, and kill them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. The question is, what is the relationship between this parable? On the problem of the Tower of Siloam. That is part of what I want to explore today. One day, some Christians were having a Thanksgiving service. And suddenly, as they were singing praises to God that morning, did not meet the arm robbers. They escaped the death. Now, who were the blessed? The people who were killed by arm robbers, even though they came early, or the people who escaped death. even though they came late. Well, the bigger question is this. Why would God allow people who are worshiping him to be killed? Is there something that is wrong with the worship of God? That God could not protect even those who came to worship him. And so they came to Jesus and said, these people were sacrificing to God, yet God allowed their blood to be mingled with their sacrifices. Surely, God 
has the power to defend those who worship him. If people are not safe, even when they come to church, even when they are worshiping the Lord, can anybody be safe? And so the obvious conclusion is that there must be something wrong with those people, even though they were worshippers. They came to Jesus and said, were they terrible sinners? Was that the reason why they were killed just like that? And Jesus said, no, they were not. And he says, why are you so bothered about the Galileans when you know that the same thing happened in your midst? Because the Tower of Siloam fell on some people. Would you then conclude that the people, the Tower of Siloam fell on, it fell on them because they are worse sinners and those it didn't fall on, he said, I tell you, no, they are not worse sinners. I brought a man who was one of those that God used to educate me in my early years of faith. Invited him here to preach, Pastor Simon Garba. And uh, he had one fantastic testimony. He was sitting in the, in the front of the bus and the tires burst. And the bus went into several somersaults. And he said he was thrown out of the bus. He does not know how he got out. And when he landed, he landed on his feet and said in his hand was his bag and all around him every single person that was in the bus all of them were it was it that all the people who died were sinners and he was the only righteous person well Jesus' answer, again, would be no. It is not because they were once sinners. And then, Jesus then contradicted his answer. And he said, unless you repent, the same thing will happen to you. In which case, the question then is, is it because they didn't repent that they all died, in which case, maybe they were worse sinners. Uh, I want to see if by the grace of God, we can unravel this quickly. Ecclesiastes, verse nine, chapter nine, verse one. Ecclesiastes 9, 1 to 4. These two I carefully explored. Even though the actions of godly and wise people are in God's hands, no one knows whether God will show them favor. The same destiny ultimately awaits everyone, whether righteous or wicked, good or bad, ceremonially clean or unclean, religious or irreligious, good people receive the same treatment as sinners. And people 
who make promises to God are treated like people who don't. It seems so tragic that everyone under the sun suffers the same fate. That is why people are not more careful to be good. Instead, they choose their own mad course, for they have no hope. There is nothing ahead but death anyway. There is hope only for the living. As they say, it is better to be a live dog than a dead lion. Praise the Lord. And so I ask, I say, well, in this life, is there any advantage to godliness? Can the godly expect certain exemptions from the vicissitudes of life? And sometimes we find that the godly go to God in disappointment. Even though the scriptures tell us the hope that is in God does not disappoint. They bring forth their CV to God. And they say, I go to church regularly. I sing in the choir. I'm a member of the prayer squad. I try to be nice to people. I give to the poor. I try as much as possible to be close to God. Nevertheless, my situation is terrible. My marriage is in disaster. I have lost my job and can't find a job. The engine in my car just knocked and now it's going to cost me a fortune. The landlord just gave me a quick notice. So what exactly is the benefit of my faith? What is my advantage? What advantage does righteousness or does the seeking of righteousness give me? The truth is that God will never, ever make the godly to feel superior to the godless. God will never, ever create a situation that will encourage us to be superior to others, to feel superior to others. If you ever feel that you are more spiritual than someone else, it is evidence that you are not and that you are a baby Christian. If you ever feel that there is some spiritual exercise or some spiritual formula which puts you at, a, at an advantage over others, it is testimony that your faith is bankrupt. Nothing about godliness inspires pride. Godliness promotes humility. Paul discovers this. He felt that he was entitled to be healed of a thorn in his flesh. But no, nothing about your godliness should give you a superiority complex. It is wickedness and ungodliness that does this. The kingdom of God is never really going to put us on a spiritual high. The kingdom of God is not going to feel that we are better than others, that we are holier than thou. No. It is not going to situate us beyond the ordinary and the mundane. In fact, it is often intentionally the opposite. Let me read to you the revelation of Job in Job 21.
Job 21. I want to read it from verse 7. Why do the wicked prosper? Going old and powerful, they live to see their children grow up and settle down. They enjoy their grandchildren. Their homes are safe from every fear. And God does not punish them. Their bulls never fail to breed. They sing with tambourine and harp. They celebrate to the sound of the flute. They spend their days in prosperity. They go down to the grave in peace. And yet, they say to God, go away. We want no part of you and your ways. And so, the situation is counterintuitive. What God does is not according to our carnal expectations. Jesus never offers any hope of reprieve in this world. He says, in this world, you will have tribulation. The hope we are offered in this world is no different from the one that Jesus encountered. And so we need to try and get some understanding. Why is it like this? Why do bad things happen to us? Even those of us who have the privilege to be called sons of God. When bad things happen to us, we start to question God. Why is this happening to me? And I answer and say, well, why not? Why should bad things not happen to us? What is so special about us? I remember an old film by Richard Pryor. His very best friend stole money from him. And when he discovered the theft, he went to the friend and said, why? Why would you do this to me? To me, of all people. And the friend said, why not? What's so special about you that somebody should not steal from you? I remember a lady friend who always complains when bad things happen. She says, I don't deserve this. Why not? Why don't you deserve it? What exactly do we deserve? What's strange about this is that when good things happen to us, we never really go to God and say, why is this happening to me? Why is this good thing happening to me? We feel we are entitled to good things. We feel that good things must happen to us. We don't say, Lord, why are you blessing me? What do I do to deserve this? We accept the blessings. We give thanks for them. 
we enjoy them. We don't give them any further thought. We take it for granted that we are entitled to goodness, but not to evil. And so when Mrs. Job asked him to curse God and die, Job asked his wife, shall we receive good things from the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil as well? We answer no, we only want the blessings. We don't want the evil. And that's why we are very selective in the scriptures that we cram and the scriptures that we quote. We don't do it here because I've stopped doing it. In most churches, the service is ended by saying goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We only want God's goodness and his mercy to follow us. We don't want evil to follow us. Or we can quote another scripture. And if I want to be facetious, I say, why don't you, after every service says, man, who is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. <laughs> uh, we would not say that. Mm. We want to buy from God exemptions from afflictions. We feel I shouldn't have a problem getting a job because I'm a child of God. I should not have a problem getting married because I'm a child of God. I should not have any problem with my health because I'm a child of God. I should not have a problem having children because I'm a, I'm a child of God. And so we fast and we pray and we petition God that he can remove from us everything and anything that is unpleasant. But then I have a question. Do we really deserve God's blessings? Do we deserve his blessings. Why don't we ask God? Does God owe us anything? How often do we count our blessings and go to the Lord with them and say, Lord God Almighty, why are you blessing me? And so I asked this morning, I say, why, why, why are some people blessed and some are not? Why are some people troubled and some may not be? Why is it that some people are not as troubled as other men? Why? Why, why do the wicked prosper? Why do people who hate God seem to get along? Why is it? Well, the people who are the thieves are the ones that win the elections. The people we don't want are the people that continue to rule us. Well, number one, we never, with God, get what we deserve. I've said that before. I'm saying it again. We don't get from God what we deserve. Perhaps because with God, we don't deserve anything. With God, 
We deserve death. But he spared us. Ecclesiastes 9.11. I have observed something else under the sun. The fastest runner doesn't always win. Sorry, something is blocking. Okay. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. And the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes go hungry. And the skillful are not necessarily wealthy. And those who are educated don't always lead successful lives. It is all decided by chance, by being in the right place at the right time. People can never predict when hard times might come. Like fish in a net or birds in a trap, people are caught by sudden tragedy. The only prophet in Healing Wings, switch off your phone. You are disturbing us. Edward Ye, you are disturbing us. People don't always get what they deserve. Not only that, people often get what others deserve. So, the drunkard kills people on the road. Nothing happens to him. He is the one that should be killed. But he doesn't get killed. David numbered Israel. But 72,000 Israelites get killed because of a sin that David committed. David was the one that committed adultery. But his son that came from adultery is the one who died. This principle is actually to our advantage because if it was not a kingdom dynamics, we would not have been saved because people get what they do not deserve we don't get what we deserve. So Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He suffered because of our sins. And in similar fashion, we must know that our sins hurt others they don't only hurt us. And that is part of the reason why God hates sin so much. Many suffer, not because of their sins, but because of the sins of others. And so let us go to where we started. What happened to the Galileans? They came to church, they came to sacrifice, they came to worship, and Herod had them killed. Jesus said, unless you repent, the same thing happens to you. He said, it was not because of their sin that they died. And then he seemed to say, it was because of their sin. He said, it was not because of their sin that they died. And he said, it was because they didn't repent. What is Jesus trying to tell us? It's a simple gospel message. Every disaster that you see, that you hear, the psalmist says, 
even with your eyes, you will behold the reward of the wicked. Every disaster preaches the same message. Repent. Any time you see a disaster, God is using it to preach to you. It is, he's talking about his judgment. Repent. Repent. Yes, it didn't happen to you. Yes, you are only seeing it. Yes, you are only hearing about it. But there's a reason why you are seeing it. A reason why you are hearing it. Because God is calling you through it to repent. Because unless you repent, you are in trouble. And then he goes from that to give us a parable of the unrepentant fig tree. And we know that trees represent men in scriptures. We are trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. And he talked about a fig tree that continued to sin. And this fig tree was not bearing fruit. And the landowner told the vineyard keeper, cut it down. This is just wasting the ground. And the vineyard keeper said, no, let's give it one more year. Let us fertilize it and see whether it will respond. If it doesn't respond in that one year, we will cut it down. What is Jesus telling us? Number one, the tree that is not bearing fruit is given the blessing of goodness. Let's understand this as a principle. God decides to be especially good to the tree that is not bearing fruit. And so the tree that is not bearing fruit is the one that gets a lot of attention. He gets it for only one year. In that one year, he gets a lot of fertilizer. He gets a lot of nutrients. He gets all kinds of advantages that the tree that is bearing fruit does not get. And so if you are not careful and if you are trying to walk in righteousness and you see the ungodly prospering, no that the ungodly has been appointed with the blessing of goodness. Hmm? Why? Because the goodness of God leads to repentance. Now, when people preach it, when people preach it in churches that don't know God, they will tell you that if you are a sinner, God is going to kill you. He will burn you up for eternity. You will fry. All kinds of things will happen to you. But no. God does not call us to himself by giving us a spirit that is not from him. He doesn't give us the spirit of fear, but of power. He gives us the spirit of love and of a sound mind. And so if you see, you will find that the wicked seem to be having a good time. The wicked seem to be prospering. All kinds of good things, quote unquote, in this world seem to be happening to them. But what about the righteous? The Bible says, in counterintuitive manner, many are the afflictions of the righteous. The righteous 
are afflicted precisely because they are righteous. What does this mean? What does this mean? Let us situate it in a polemic that we have been discussing. The prodigal son is the unrighteous son. He's the one that wasted his livelihood in riotous living, went away from the father. But when he came back, he was the one that received the blessing of goodness. But the older son, who was faithful, who did not leave home, was dejected because he did not understand the principles of God. Because he felt he was the one that should be entitled to the blessing of goodness. Not so, according to God. He is going to pour out his blessing on the sinner. For one reason, that the sinner would repent. To bring the sinner to repentance. What is going to happen to the righteous? Let us be instructed by Jesus. John 15. Jesus says, I'm the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. What does it mean to prune? Pruning is problematic. Pruning is painful. Pruning means that affliction is brought to the righteous. Pruning means that certain inconveniences are brought to the righteous. Why? Because if we bring the principles of agriculture into the spiritual realm, when you prune a plant, it grows more. It bears more fruit. So the lot of the righteous is really not the blessing, 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 blessing that we pray for. It is actually the pruning the pruning. And so the blessing of goodness is not a reward for good behavior. The blessing of righteous, of goodness is not a reward for righteousness. It is actually designed to bring the badly behaved to repentance. In the same manner, When we see any disaster, any problematic in the world, it is calling us to repentance. The disciples of Jesus only had one message. They went out and asked all men, to repent. They only preached about repentance. When you go out today, so many different things are going to tell you the same thing, going to give you the same message. It is time to repent. Repent 
because the kingdom of God is not only near, it's already here. Let us pray. God is he's calling us back to himself.